Good morning. My name is Steve Allen, and I am the pastor of the Shiloh Baptist Church. We are located at 1210 South Eugene Street in Greensboro, North Carolina. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him uh, upon the loud cymbals or with the loud cymbals and praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Heavenly Father, we have come, we've gathered in your name to worship you. We've come from all nooks and crannies, some God from east, some from the west, some from the north, and some from the south. We've come, God, using different mediums. Some are in New York who are listening to your worship service. Some may be in Virginia this morning. Some may be in Durham, North Carolina. Others may be in Greensboro, North Carolina. But God, we come united on one accord and with one purpose. We have come to praise your holy name. We come, God, because you've been good to us. We come, God, because we want to bless your holy name. We ask, God, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. This morning we come and we invite you to go with us to the letter of the Philippians, to the fourth chapter, the book of Philippians, the fourth chapter. We will lift up three verses for your hearing pleasure this morning. Begin with verse four, verse six, and verse seven. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We ask that you pray for us and pray with us as we preach from the subject, rejoice, don't worry, and be happy. Rejoice, don't worry, and be happy. On last Sunday, we preached from the subject, he's working it out for you. When I finished preaching the sermon, I, I, I left on a natural high. I hope that many of you who joined with us did too. In last week's sermon, we cataloged so many of the difficulties that we're facing in our society today, but there was a difficulty that I neglected to include in that sermon. Our nation is a divided nation. The closer that we get to November 3rd, 2020, the more divided we seem to get. Many of us watched uh, with horror the first of the presidential debates and we were horrified to see the disregard for uh, abiding by the rules and the lack of civility and the cheap shots and indeed low blows that seemed to characterize the debate. Perhaps we shouldn't even uh, you know, lift it up to that high esteem. We should say the argument. Perhaps even more shocking, however, is the fact that after this event, 
persons took to the airways and attempted to justify the behavior that was exhibited as though nothing wrong had ever taken place. Could this be because such rude and obnoxious behavior has become the order of the day? Have we stooped so low as a nation that we fail to express outrage and even dismay over misconduct by people who we hold out as our nation's leaders? Sadly, what we witness is not an aberration. We see the inability of persons to disagree without being disagreeable in so many of our walks of life, in our civic organizations, uh, in our churches, yes, even in the body of Christ. People don't know how to go along or how to get along with one another. People who say that they believe the same thing have been baptized under the same blood and are working under the same banner for the same cause, but are constantly hindering the very purpose for which the organizations have been established, all because they put themselves uh, as more important or above the organizations that they profess to love and to support. That's why we have seen the death spiral of so many of our revered institutions in our nations and the downfall of so many organizations. And yes, uh, organizations and institutions that were once hallowed, that's H-A-L-L-O-W-E-D, that means held in great esteem or high regard, are now hallowed. That's H-O-L-L-O-W-E-D. That means that they're thinning out, that there's not much substance left, and if we're not careful, they may even die. This is the situation that our country faces today. Or our governing bodies are so polarized that they cannot put aside partisan politics and govern for the good of the nation. Instead of a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, what we have right now is a government that is conveniently failing the people. There was a time when those who were elected to the highest offices in the lands or indeed our states would indeed strive to, to attempt to do what was in the best interest of all the people. But now we feel like we only have to, to cater to a crowd, to, to, to people that supported us or the people that voted for us. These actions only lead to further strife and greater division in the country. This leads us to wonder, is there any hope for unity or coming together as a people in these United States when we seem to be divided by so many things that keep us apart? Is there any way that people who profess to love this nation, to love this country, to, to adhere to the same values can come to share in a commonness of goal and purpose so that our nation can be brought and made whole together again. Our answer may very well be found in our text today. Our text is found in the fourth chapter of Philippians. Paul has written a letter to the church in Philippi, a church that he was no stranger to because he had established a church. The church in Philippi it found itself to be a church divided. Two members, two of the leaders of the church, had once worked side by side with one another. Two of the church leaders had once been united in the cause of Christ. But like so many times, even today, they had a falling out. You all don't know anything about falling out among friends, do you? You don't know, do you, do you remember, or have you ever had occasion where you fell out with one of your friends? And do you know uh, what that can mean? Yeah, it can mean it's a war. That means two friends who work side by side, two friends who may have called themselves bosom buddies and best friends and pinky brothers or sisters and who may have uh, shared, sat down at the same table, uh, who were so close that people thought they were brothers or sisters, can come to that to be at odds with one another 
even in the body of Christ, so much so that their very existence is a detriment to the work of the church. Their disagreement has taken uh, on gigantic proportions and their misbehavior, they're calling each other names, they're rolling their eyes, uh, their uh, crude comments, and indeed uh, their one-upmanship may cast a cloud on what it means to be a child of God. Just like the misbehavior in the so-called presidential debate the other night has cast a cloud on what it is to be an elected official in this nation and indeed what this nation has come to. The strife between these two sisters in the church was of such an epic proportion that Paul gets wind of it. He's not even in the country, y'all. He's no, no, nowhere around, and yet the word has gotten back to Paul. So Paul tries to, to bring it to an end. Paul goes so far as to remind these two sisters to be of the same mind. Now, Paul didn't ask them to, to take each other's side. He didn't ask that one had to agree with the other and that he didn't have to say the other was right or the other one was wrong. No, Paul, what Paul does is to call to conscience to remind them that it's not about them. That is the root and cause of so much of our division in our nation, so much of the division and the rancor that we see in our organizations and yes, even in some of our churches. We have people that believe that it's all about what they want. We have people who believe it's all about what they think. They forget it isn't about you and it isn't about me. It's, you know, early on, uh, you know what it really is about? It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Early on in the book of Philippians, Paul admonishes the church to let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than they themselves. In other words, Paul tells him to not look on his own things, but every man needs to look on the things of others. Paul is not telling him to try to, to, to take what other people have. They're talking about hold others in great esteem. Each first Sunday, I read a poem. It's part of our communion service. That poem is called Others. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Help me in all the work I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must needs be done for others. Let self, oh, that's, the, that's what the focus is in the text today. Let self be crucified and, and, and slain and buried deep and all in vain may efforts be to rise again unless to live for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven's begun, May I forget the crown I've won while thinking still of others. Others, Lord, yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I might live like thee. That's what Paul is saying to these two sisters so long ago in the church of Corinth. Just let this mind be in you, you know, to think of others. Let, you know, and then he, what he does he does what we all need to stop and take a moment and think about. Paul says we have a perfect role model. We have someone that we can imitate and someone that we can emulate. He says we need to act. We need to think. We need to behave. We need to walk. We need to talk. We need to, to you know, to do everything in the manner of Christ Jesus. Paul says... It clearly, he says it in the second chapter, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the perfect way to deal with strife in our nation today. This is the perfect way to end, uh, stamp out the discord, the rancor and the division 
that is so easily tearing this nation apart. We need some folks to step back. Now, notice I didn't say stand down. During the presidential debate, our nation's president was asked to renounce the white supremacy and the racial bigotry and the, of the Ku Klux Klan and the white supremacy group known as the Proud Boys. Now, what do they have to be proud of? They're proud to, be hate, to hate people because of the color of their skin or because of their ethnic origin or because of their faith. Instead of rising to the occasion, 45 told the so-called Proud Boys to stand down and stand by. In other words, uh, the conflict is going to still continue. He was not able to try and unite our nation against the racial bigotry that if, you know what, if we don't solve the race problem in our country, we're going to all die together as fools. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. said so many years ago. But Paul lets us know that we don't have to continue to be divided. We do have a common ground. And what's so interesting in our country is we profess to be a Christian nation. Well, if we're truly a Christian nation, and I know we have different faiths, we have different origins, different religions, but you know what? Even the Islamic faith believes in God. You know, the Jewish faith believes in God and all of them came from the same origins. So if we all believe in God, what is the commonality of us? Well, we were all created by God for one thing. We were all created in his image. But we also, those of us who are the Christian uh, tenets of faith, we need to understand that we have a common cause and we have a way forward. There is a way forward. Our text is clear this morning. So here's the things that we need to do. First, rejoice in the Lord. And rejoice in the Lord, rejoice. You know, we rejoice in so many things. We rejoice in watching the football games unless your team loses. We rejoice in the television shows we watch. We may rejoice in something that may have happened, uh, you know, the, the good that happened in our lives. But those are not really the things that we are rejoicing. We ought to rejoice in the only thing that's worth rejoicing in, the only thing that really matters. We ought to rejoice in the Lord. The word rejoice means to find joy in the Lord, to find joy. Uh, yeah, he is the center of our joy. You know, I, you know, life sometimes is difficult. There are times when there's not much joy to be found uh, in the circumstances of our lives. But you know what? I have lived long enough now. I have seen people rejoicing even in the most difficult circumstances. As a little boy, one of the great things I was able to witness was seeing people who I know had it hard. I knew had it hard. I knew what their home, the personal home lives were. I knew their struggles. But when they came to the house of the Lord, they were able to worship God. They were able to rejoice in the Lord. And not only did they rejoice inside the church, they rejoiced in their daily living. We need to rejoice in the Lord. The word rejoice uh, in a nation that professes to be one nation under God. We ought to be able to come to the agreement that we can rejoice in the Lord. In churches that profess to be servants of the Most High God. In churches where people say that they are disciples of Jesus. We ought to be able to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice not in the circumstances that you're living in right now. Rejoice not in the hardships that you're facing right now. Rejoice not in the way uh, that life is going in right now. Don't rejoice. Uh, don't put your hope in elected officials. Don't put your hopes in your pastors. Don't put your hope in your church leaders. Don't put your hope in the deacons. Don't put your hope in the trustees. Don't put your hope in the missionaries. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. We rejoice because we have a hope. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in Jesus. We rejoice because Jesus uh, has made a way for us. Uh, we rejoice uh, because we can depend on him. 
We can call on him uh, in the midnight hour. We can call on him in the time of our sorrows. We rejoice uh, no matter what you're going through. You can rejoice in the Lord. The second thing, the second thing we need to do is stop worrying. Stop worrying. Stop being so anxious. You know, most of the discord we experience in our lives, most of the discord we have and the rancor that we have in our nation is because of our frustrations. We are frustrated people. We're frustrated because we can't have our way. We're frustrated because we're unable to go to work. We're frustrated because our children are not able to go to school. We're frustrated because our children won't mind. We're frustrated by so many things. And when we have all these frustrations, they build up and the frustrations come out of us. We become angry and we take out our frustrations on one another. But we don't have to do that. Verse six of our text, Paul reminds us to stop being anxious. Well, Paul says, stop worrying so much. Paul puts it this way. Paul says, be careful for nothing. Now, now what you really means is years ago, Bob Marley was a famous reggae singer and he wrote the song, don't worry, be happy. But I'm so glad uh, that we don't have to depend on Bob Marley for advice on how to live our lives. Uh, you know, sometimes people give a good advice, uh, but they don't follow the advice uh, that they give. Uh, sometimes uh, doctors will tell you that you need to exercise in order to, to maintain your health, uh, and then they're overweight themselves. Uh, sometimes uh, preachers will tell you that you ought to live right, and, and they don't live right themselves. Uh, sometimes uh, people will tell you uh, where everywhere about what you ought to do and what you ought not to do. Uh, but as soon as you uh, turn your back, uh, they go and do the very things uh, that they ought not to do. Uh, but I'm so glad uh, that we don't have to depend upon other folks uh, who may not be doing the right things. Uh, the Bible gives us uh, all the instructions that we need uh, on how to live uh, a profitable life. Uh, there is a way out of all of our troubles. There is a way out of all of our struggles. Be careful for nothing. Doesn't mean that you won't have troubles in your life. Be careful for nothing. Doesn't mean that you won't have to cry sometimes. But you need to turn over all of your worries. There is a way out of all of your troubles. You need to turn them over to the Lord. Not some things. You know how you turn some things over to God? Yeah, there's some things you'll give to God in a heartbeat. But then what you do is you take it back from him. How in the world are you going to give it to the Lord and then take it back? If you trust God, if it's more than you can handle, then you need to turn it over to the Lord and leave your burdens there. The Lord is able to handle not some of your problems. He's able to handle everything. And the other thing that he tells us in his text is, he says, you know, you're having troubles. Yes, it may be in your home, but you don't worry. Having trouble on your job, but what is worrying going to do about it? Having trouble on top of troubles. Don't worry. Be careful. He says, don't be anxious. In other words, there is a way out of your troubles. He says, and it's clear. He says, pray about it. He says, in prayer, take everything to the Lord in prayer. Paul says prayer is the answer. I don't know about you, but I've learned to pray. I, I, I've answered. I've learned that the answer to what I'm going through in life is I have learned to pray with faith to guide me. I've found the way. Any praying folks uh, in the church this morning, have you learned to turn everything over to God in prayer? Have you learned to trust God uh, with the things that are more than you can bear? Have you learned to trust God with all your troubles? Paul says, let your prayers and your supplications, those are the desires of your heart, uh, the things that worry you most, uh, turn them over to the Lord. Uh, turn them over to the Lord and leave them there. Paul says, let the Lord know all about your troubles. Yeah, let the Lord know. You know, stop telling people, you know, sometimes we talk too much. We tell everybody, every, everybody we meet about what we, you know, what's going on in our lives. And then some people don't care anything about you. 
They don't want to know anything about your troubles. You need to take it to somebody who has your best interest at heart. You need to have some, you need to turn it to the Lord. Because the Lord, you know, first of all, he's able to do something about it. So many times we run to people that their troubles are worse than ours. But let me say this too. That if you turn it to the Lord, you need, it's a way, it's a proper way to go before the Lord. There's a proper way to approach the Lord. We need to go to the Lord with thanksgiving. Have you ever gone to the Lord with thanksgiving? Yeah, I know we go all the time. We tell the Lord what we want, what we need. But before we engage in any of that, we need to tell the Lord, thank you. We need to thank the Lord for what he's already done. We need to thank the Lord for what he's already brought us through. We need to thank the Lord for the last night wasn't our last night. We want to thank him that he woke us up this morning and that he started us on our way. We want to thank him for putting food on our table and clothes on our backs and that we are in our right minds. There's a lot of reasons to give God thanks. And if you don't believe it, then you need to go talk. You need to go to an asylum and see somebody that's lost their mind. You, you know, if you're able to get up and walk around under your own power, you're able to walk under your own feet. You got reason to give God praise. If you can still see out of your eyes, you got reason to give God praise. And if you can't see out of your eyes, you still got reason to give God praise. But you know what? We need to approach God with a heart of thanksgiving. Rejoice, he says. Don't worry. And if you do these two things, if you rejoice, not in the things of this world, if you rejoice in the Lord always and turn your anxieties and your worries over to him in prayer with thanksgiving after. Can you say after? After you've done these things, the peace of God. I'm not talking about the peace of this world because, you know, that's that, that's that's fragile, isn't it? They, they want to give a Nobel Peace Prizes. They give them out. And the day after they give out Nobel Peace Prize, they'll go right back to war. They declare peace in some uh, foreign country and the bullets are still flying. That, that peace is no peace at all. But if you've done the things, if you rejoice in the Lord, if you will turn everything over to the Lord and leave them there in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in your heart, then the peace of God, the peace of God, the peace of God, the, pay, the peace, that perfect peace, the peace of God, that, that peace that will allow you to rejoice when all the world is crumbling around about you, that peace that will give you a calmness in the midst of troubled times, that peace that will make your soul, yeah, yeah, it will be well with your soul. When, when, it, when, yeah, it will be well with your soul. That kind of peace. The peace that comes from knowing that God, the same God, that has his eyes on the sparrow, has his eyes and he watches you. God will give you the peace which passes all human understanding. In other words, you won't be able to, you know, you say, how did this happen? How, did, how can somebody be at peace when all the storm is raging in their lives? They can be at peace because God is able to be in them and with them. And God will give you that perfect peace that only comes from here. What I'm trying to say to you today is God can change our hearts and God can change our minds if we will bow down to him. And if we will humble ourselves before him, then he will fill our lives with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And when that Holy Spirit comes in, there'll be something on the inside that's working on the outside. And what a wonderful change. What a wonderful change will come into our lives. We won't think the way we used to think. We won't talk the way we used to talk. We won't walk the way we used to walk. We won't live the way that we used to live. And people will know 
that we are at perfect peace. God will guard our minds. God will guard your hearts. Won't you come to him today? Won't you experience that perfect peace that passes all human understanding? Won't you to rejoice, don't worry, and be happy. You will have a happiness that the world cannot give. You will have a joy that the world cannot take away. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've been worried about so many things in our lives. God, so many things, so many troubles keep us up at night. But yet, God, you have established a way forward in our lives. You have promised us a comfort and a joy. You promised, God, that you will allow us to walk in your perfect peace and to experience the joy that the world cannot give. We thank you, God, that you extended that offer to us through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you loved us enough that you were willing to sacrifice your only begotten son to save a wretch like me we ask, Heavenly Father, that somehow you would deem us to be acceptable by the blood of Jesus. We believe, God, that he died for, for even me. We believe, God, that he's already paid the price for my sins. We believe, God, that you have wiped the slate clean and that by the blood that was shed on Calvary, we are now reconciled through his blood and acceptable in your sight. I come to you today pleading the blood of Jesus. I come to you today accepting him as the Lord and Savior of my life. And God, I ask now, God, that you would change my heart, change my mind, and fill me with the mind of Christ so that I may live as you would have me to live. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer with me today and you've sincere and you mean to live for Jesus, then you have experienced the joy of salvation. We offer you now the opportunity to connect with the body of Christ. You've taken the first step, but you need to come and to be taught what it means to truly be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You need to experience the joy of assembling together in the body, of growing in grace, of walking in his mercy, and embraced by his love. You need to do Bible study that you may study and show yourself approved. You need to be led by one who loves God. We offer you that opportunity today. You may join with us by calling us at 336-272-1166, or you may email us at shilohcares at gmail.com. That's S-H-I-L-O-H-C-A-R-E-S at gmail.com. Thank you. We look forward to serving you in the body of Christ. We pray that today's worship service has been uplifting and encouraging for you, and hopefully you heard a word from the Lord. We can give you an opportunity to engage in the worship of giving. 
God only requires to give us to give what we're able to give. If you're able to give, we ask that you would give as unto the Lord. You may do so by mailing your gift to Shallow Baptist Church, 1210 South Eugene Street, Greensboro, North Carolina. The zip code is 27406. If you're technologically inclined and you have Cash App, or you may download Cash App and make your donation to dollar sign Shiloh, S-H-I-L-O-H-B-C-G-S-O. And again, that's dollar sign Shiloh, S-H-I-L-O-H-B-C-G-S-O. And the third way that you may give is by dropping your envelope or your, your giving by the church if you're in the Greensboro community. We hope that you have been blessed this week. We would like to stay connected with you throughout the week. There are several ways that we can do that. One, of course, you may join with us on Monday night uh, for our discipleship training series, uh, Training Faithful Men, Training Faithful Women. It's offered at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook and 6.45 p.m. on YouTube. And then, of course, you may pray with us each and every morning at 7.30 by dialing 1, area code 425, 436-6343, access code 375-386. You may use that same conference call line and join with us on our Wednesday evening Bible study at 7 o'clock p.m. Again, that number is 1, air code 425-436-6343, access code 375-386. And then, of course, we hope that you will join with us on next Sunday morning for our worship service at 11 o'clock a.m., we ask that you would share the good news of where you are watching uh, this worship service and that you would have a watch party and share and invite your friends to join with you. If you have a sweet tooth, you don't have to go to the store. We know that people are still uh, concerned about going out. You can order by going to our online store. That is http colon double backslash Shiloh Baptist Church, S H I L O. H Baptist Church dot Terry Lynn T E R R I L Y N N dot com. And if you like to have fresh fruit straight from Florida, oranges, grapefruit, and apples, then you go to our web address WW Florida, like the state, Indian River, like the river, grows, that's all one word, dot com backslash E commerce written out e c o m m e r c e backslash one zero two zero three eight three thank you so much for worshiping us and supporting our ministry we pray that god will shower you with his richest blessings for not only for you but for those you love have a blessed day in the lord